Dr. Jacob Torres, researcher with Santa Barbara Nutrients, and today I'm speaking with Sally Norton. Sally obtained her Bachelor's of Science from Cornell University and later her Master's of Public Health degree from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. I first met Sally many years ago when she presented on the topic of oxalate and lost seasonality, leading to increased oxalate consumption in our healthy food choices. She has spent extensive time researching the topic of oxalate and has personal experience with its negative health consequences. She continues to use her experience and knowledge on the subject by coaching others struggling with oxalate's negative effects. I hope that you find value in our conversation and please enjoy the conversation with Sally Norton. Welcome everybody. It's nice to see everyone. Hopefully you enjoy this show today. So I have today with me Sally K. Norton. Uh, why don't you tell us a little about yourself, Sally? Yeah, well, I'm a lifelong public health professional. And I'm finding myself outside of academia now for 10 years. I used to work for university medical schools. And the last one I worked for, I was a research administrator and helped my fellow researchers pull together their projects and their specific aims and their NIH proposals and cranked out a lot of proposals. And in like three years, we pulled in, I don't know, $26 million in funding. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So we were very productive and, uh, you know, also handled all those communications, administrative communications with the funding agencies and all of that. But a, a lot of the fun is in research design. And before that, I worked at the program on integrative medicine at the medical school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And there we did health professions education and, and hoping to expand the curriculum beyond this standard medical model, which was primarily reliant on surgery and pharmaceutical products as a way of managing people's problems. And the idea with integrated medicine is to bring in lifestyle a lot more profoundly and a lot more up front and center and even things like massage and then alternative therapies like acupuncture and so on. Of course, diet and so on. So <laughs> yeah, it's not we, good did, diet. <laughs> <laughs> we did some of that. And interestingly enough, uh, some of the professions there in academia were not really big players. They didn't really want to play this game about, you know, the pharmaceutical um, faculty thought all herbs and foods was a weed and seed conversation, uncontrolled and not useful. And um, others were very interested, but couldn't really get there. This was really interesting being in academic um, circles, being on the curriculum committee, developing, you know, continuing education opportunities and seeing who or who won't play. Um, but I, I worked in that field in integrative medicine. So I had colleagues who worked in academic medicine, delivering clinical care. I had colleagues who were academics who, who didn't do clinical care. And then I had lots of colleagues and associates who were in the community providing healthcare services that were non-conventional, non-MD services that, for health. And I've been interested in health and nutrition since I was a little girl. And in seventh grade, I decided I would get a degree in nutrition. Because my science teacher showed us this film strip that said, oh, hot dogs will give you cancer and kill you, and <laughs> raw broccoli will save your day and you won't get cancer. And I thought, well, <laughs> cool. You know, like if you know what to do, then you can have a whole great life and never get sick and be productive and happy and enjoy life. So I, well, who wouldn't want to know that? And I could learn that and help other people who want that too. So I've been interested in preventing illness in myself and others since forever. And I've always been adventurous with foods and love things like, you know, pickled herring and yogurt as a five-year-old. <laughs> like, I'm like willing to eat whatever <laughs> and, and like real food, you know. So I'm a food geek and a nutrition geek. And a, I've been in uh, health and wellness promotion. I worked in the inner city. I worked in very poor rural communities. Um, I've worked with all kinds of folks over the years. And I myself was quite the like compliant goody two shoes and I I left Cornell University where I got my nutrition degree believing that fat caused all illnesses of all kinds and when, salt when was going to kill you when too. was that I'm oh, sorry when does that that you were in Cornell? I was at Cornell uh, when T Colin Campbell was still teaching he was one of my professors he wrote a book called the China study mm-hmm 
he was an ideological vegan. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> I, I went, I was there, I had a broken experience at Cornell because when I, before I even got to Cornell, I started doing some of my basic work at the community college first and got some of my big stuff out of the way, my calculus and anatomy and chemistry and stuff out of the way before I went to the Cornell, saved my family a little money. And, um, before I even got there, I was having foot problems. And then the Cornell campus, which has got big gorges and it's hilly and it's spread out. It's a nice, beautiful campus, requires good feet, which I didn't have. And I got within my first semester, I couldn't even make it to dinner anymore. My my foot became two feet that hurt. Mm. I had a broken sesamoid in my left foot. And ended up needing permission to drive on campus and all this stuff. And none of that was working. And I eventually had to leave on a medical leave of absence. I was being treated by a university orthopedic doctor who worked with the football team at Syracuse University. And he had me on high doses of ibuprofen, 3,600 milligrams a day for five years. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That, you might know that that's a kidney killer. Mm-hmm. Ibuprofen and, and NSAIDs are great at wiping out your digestive tract and your kidneys. Luckily, my kidneys put up with that pretty well because um, I don't have any obvious kidney problems, despite a diet that is also trying to kill my kidneys. So some of us have the good fortune of good kidneys, even though what I learned at Cornell was to avoid all salt all fat, avoid animal products, stay vegetarian. And then I, after I left Cornell, I went vegan. So I did 16 year stint of avoiding animal products, completely being scared to death of butter and, and salt and learning to live on beans and brown rice and stuff like that. Well, it turned out that was all a bad idea, even though I'm this great expert from Cornell University in health promotion and teaching people to eat less meat and, ah, and going to, um, when I went to graduate school for public health, initially I applied to and was accepted to the nutrition program because of my broken experience at Cornell, which I guess I didn't finish the story, is okay. that I had to leave Cornell on this medical leave of absence and I had to use up all four years because during that time I had foot surgery on both feet and I didn't recover from the surgery well. I remained on crutches, painkillers, and still was struggling. I was swimming every day to try to get blood flow in my feet and try to help them heal and doing everything I knew to do. And I was still struggling. I was still also growing Swiss chard and eating mm. it. So I went back to Cornell after the four year leave of absence. Now as a married person living in married housing where I had a little plot of land outside my door and I was growing Swiss chard mm -hmm. and having problems and had never connected that to health problems, but it turns out fast forward decades later, I'm 49 decades later and f f suddenly realizing that a lot of the things that I was struggling with in my 20s that started earlier before my 20s, heavy arthritis, back pain, mm. foot problems were all related to my love of Swiss chard and vegetables and beans and some of this healthy food. And yeah, that so was a real revelation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, so you're I'm definitely a... <laughs> and I'm finally learning like what I have been doing to, to take care of my health and live a great life and be productive and not be sick has been making me sick. Yeah. So you definitely have alluded to the thing that we're here to talk about. So, <laughs> you know, this, if Fabio is not familiar, you know, our, uh, you know, my research lab has done a, done some research in polycystic kidney disease and we've done particular, you know, my particular research was on looking at the way that these, you know, oxalate crystals and calcium phosphate crystals can exacerbate polycystic kidney disease, at least in animal models. And, you know, that was, it was pretty interesting stuff. You know, we were, I was looking specifically at PKD, but it kind of translates to, you know, all humans because we figured out kind of a mechanism of how our body clears out these little crystals as well. So it's, you know, that's kind of the, why we got interested in this whole, whole thing. And I know when we met, so we met at the Ancestral Health Symposium, and it kind of was like the perfect timing for me because that was, you know, exactly what, what I was thinking about with oxalate. And it's kind of, I, I didn't realize how much of a bigger world, you know, oxalate actually was. It's not, it's not, you know, we always think about it as kidneys. That's like, you know, from research, I've read a lot of papers and 
that's it. That's all you hear about is kidney stones and kidneys and that's no other mention of oxalate other than if you drink, if you eat too much, you can die from poisoning of the kidneys, right? Like that's the only, that's really the only, uh, the only thing that they mentioned in there. And so, you know, I I was really fascinated when you started talking about the other ways that oxalate is damaging and they all make a lot of sense, right? And it's, there's a little bit of research out there and it seemed to be kind of a really hot topic for a little while, right? People were interested in this and thinking about it, but then kind of just fades into, into the literature, right? Just kind of disappears. So I think it's kind of, it's cool that you're, you know, you're thinking about it again. And I think it's a really important because we are, we should be thinking about it, right? We should, you know, now that they have a whole ancestral uh, living movement, this is becoming even a bigger issue because people are rediscovering these high oxalate foods. <laughs> you know, we're trying to get rid of all of the, the stuff that's bad for us in one way. And then we eventually end up adding in a whole bunch of stuff that's bad for us in a different way. So can you just uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, oxalate and kind of how, what is it, how it's getting, how it's bad for us? Yeah, oxalate's fascinating. And, you know, when I first started learning about oxalate, the person who, who triggered me to even imagine this was a woman who's got a lay background. She's not a public health person, nutrition person like me, but she was right near where I was in North Carolina, like probably living or working 45 minutes from where I was. And if I'd known her, I would have invited her to our integrative medicine conference and and to faculty development conferences, but I didn't. And so I learned about it through her that oxalate is something that can affect extra renal tissues. Now in college, My textbooks had, you know, textbooks have double columns in them. And so Mm -hmm. imagine an inch and a half of one column. That's the whole amount in that textbook. And in some textbooks, two different authors, the way textbooks are written is there's this editor guy with the vision, and then he picks out people to write the chapters. Mm -hmm. And each chapter person is writing pretty much in isolation. And then the editor has to kind of make it all work as a book. Um, And so the other the other chapter has another inch and a half devoted to oxalate with two totally different lists about which foods have oxalate in them and what it means. And like, it's so limited. So the people who choose to write textbooks don't cover this generally. And um, our professors, especially people like Dr. Colin Campbell, who is believing in vegetables and vegetarianism is, or don't find this a compelling topic, which is, makes no sense if you actually understand the topic. But understanding the topic does require a lot of devotion because it has been spread across the literature for 230 years and it's spread across these different professions. And sometime in probably the mid 20th century, we decided that the thing about oxalate that mattered was the kidney stones. And I have to say as a woman, now you may find this as a very sexist comment, But the people who fund research, the people who decide who gets funding. Now, I know a lot about this because I've worked in the field of getting research dollars and how bad it's gotten. And I didn't really feel too bad about quitting my job because I was sort of tired of the system and how it isn't working for innovation. Like young researchers like you who are ready to be freed up to think broader, have a harder time getting the, the leaders in their field to approve their wacky ideas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of middle-aged men are the people who get kidney stones. And they're the same guys mm-hmm. who decide who gets research funding. We women, despite our ibuprofen addiction <laughs> and our high use of oxalate foods, can pee out crystals like crazy. And I mean, I must have super tubules that can dilate the <laughs> heck out of themselves. <laughs> I'm feeling proud of my dilating tubules and I'm so (laughs) glad you told me why I've been peeing out clouds and clouds and clouds of urine. Like I've been giving urine samples for years that are really whitey, cloudy, messy, not nice. Good urine looks crystal clear. Like you've just dropped a drop of food dye in it and it's watery. But my Mm. urine is most of the time not. It's very cloudy. And that could be an indicator of light refracting off of crystals. And that's called crystal urea. And I've been somehow remarkably able to produce crystalline urine for decades, despite the ibuprofen. Now, 
your average guy might be more prone to be that turning into kidney stones. And there's lots of reasons for that. We're trying to figure that out, like the hormones and so on. But one thing that's clear in my research is that the thing that's protecting me is my kidney superpower, not only to dilate, but to develop and produce these proteins that prevent those crystals from becoming a kidney stone. So they they come out as separate crystals, little things that the tubules can release. But once those crystals start clumping and aggregating, they become a stone. And they're aggregating because the pH isn't right and there's not enough of these proteins and, and citrate that's interfering with that clumping. Normally, our kidneys are designed to prevent that clumping. And women are particularly good at that. Unfortunately, that is a very inflammatory process, having to protect your kidneys from crystals all the time. The crystals are constantly irritating cells in ways that mm-hmm. cause membrane and cell damage. When cells start leaking stuff, the immune system takes that to great offense. They don't think their cells should be sick and leaking stuff. They believe that that's a sign of an attack from like bacteria and, and, mm-hmm. and dangerous things. So they say, oh, danger, danger, leaking cells. And so... By having crystals in your urine all the time, you're turning on inflammatory problems and you're creating inflammation somewhere. And the sad thing is, is that many cells do this and produce these kind of compounds that tell the body that inflammation is required here because we're under threat by a a threatening compound or a threatening organism. And so the chronic use of high oxalate foods can produce a lots of inflammatory related problems and it doesn't have to be just the kidneys that are suffering. In fact, that's the sad thing is that by noting the obvious problem of a kidney stone, which is hard to miss, it's hard to overlook a serious kidney stone because a person starts screaming in agony and ends up in life-threatening situations because what makes a kidney stone especially bad for you is it's blocking the flow of urine and backing up the flow of urine creates all kinds of problems. The, the, one of the problems that used to always kill people is infection. Because if you, mm-hmm. part of the why the kidneys stay in the bladder and everything stays healthy is that there's always movement of fluids are constantly circulating. You stop the circulation of fluids and then infection can occur. And that's what used to make kidney stones so deadly and dangerous. But the chronic poor functioning of an inflamed kidney leads to total body derangements on electrolytes and other compounds that allow cells to work properly. So upstream, the toxicity that happens from poor functioning kidneys can cause all kinds of health problems. But that's looking, our perspective of funding kidney stone research is the primary problem that oxalates cause because um, you know, calcium oxalate stone in the kidneys is is a big problem. And most kidney stones are made of oxalate. That's a big problem. But, but by focusing all our energy there, we're missing the bigger story mm-hmm. of the fact that oxalate can damage cells, cause them to leak, turn on inflammation, turn on fibrotic processes, turn on disease processes that can play out in a number of ways. And that, that's... Um, What sometimes we call a terrain issue, like the terrain of my Mm -hmm. genetics, my femaleness, my whatever, my nutritional status, my lifestyle can affect how a toxin like oxalate plays out in my health. Yeah. Oh, well, you you touched on a lot of different things there. I think there's a lot of a lot of stuff that might be maybe need a little bit of help explaining. So I guess, first of all, uh, you know, we didn't say what oxalate actually is. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So I think that's the I think, first of all, like why, you know, why do plants have oxalate or I guess what? Let me back up. What is oxalate? Let's do it right there. So that's the simplest. Let's talk about the chemistry of oxalate. So it's tiny little compound. It has two carbons four oxygens, a couple double bonds. It has this ability to drop its protons, which makes it an acid. So it, its parent compound is called oxalic acid. It has these two hydrogens and almost you never see that other hydrogen on it because it's always got this sort of ionic potential where it drops a positive charged proton or hydrogen molecule and it has this negative charge to it. So things that are charged like that, they, they become ions that are potentially dissolvable in water or other fluids. And they have this power to interact because that's an electromagnetic charge. Mm -hmm. 
So oftentimes in biology, it'll drop the other proton and have a two negative charges on it. So that two negative charges is very attractive to calcium and magnesium. So it tends to bind to calcium and magnesium and other minerals very easily. It, it, it's called a salt when it's a combined with a mineral. So the, there's a salt that easily breaks up. We call those soluble salts. And plants make the soluble salts of oxalate, that's potassium oxalate and sodium oxalate and so on. Then you eat that soluble salt of oxalate and that breaks apart and you have this ion of oxalate ion, oxalic acid ion, and it can collect calcium and magnesium. It can either take it from your food or it can enter your blood. It, it uh, enters the body because it's such a small compound and it's water soluble as an ion. It floats between the cells of the gut. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's how it gets in the body. They call that paracellular transport. And the interesting thing is the amount that can get into your body depends on how the connections are doing between your cells of your gut. And this is so passive that's, diffusion you're referring that's to. That's passive right? diffusion. It's just riding in the water. So it's just dissolved in the water and it's just following the natural flow of the fluids that ride between the cells. And so that's one reason why some of the researchers suggest that when you juice your vegetables, so oxalate is made by a lot of plants, but some plants are really good at oxalate production. Spinach being the most famous high oxalate food out there is spinach. And spinach, as you said, has come into great popularity these days, especially as we realize, oh, well, telling everybody low fat all these years has created diabetes and... <laughs> <laughs> obesity and all that is a big problem. Well, maybe we should quit eating all this high carb stuff. But you know, there's only two ways to get energy. It's either carbs or fat. I mean, protein's not really meant to be for fuel or for energy. It's a it's really a structural building block material. So those we call our macronutrients. So we've been told to eat low fat. So we're eating high carb and high carbs create diabetes and obesity. Obesity causes those connections between the cells of the gut to get loose. So the way the way the um, lining of the gut works is you have a single rows of cells. Now there's different kinds of cells there, but generally they're held together by these hooks of proteins. So in the cell membranes, there's these proteins and have these outer hooks. They work like Velcro. So the cells all hold themselves together with these protein hooks like Velcro hooks. And so sliding in between the little teeth of the Velcro is the water and fluid and the oxalic acid ions. Now, when you're obese, the Velcro hooks aren't so good. And so that we call that, you know, like more permeability in the gut. Anybody who's well, got also any, any other sort of gut permeability issues like the, uh, colitis or like Crohn's disease, these other other well-known, um, you know, gut inflammatory bowel diseases even right. just ibs which is really yeah. common so we see we're seeing a huge increase in gut problems and ibs and in this inflammatory bowel disease they kind of splay open these these little velcro hooks and just create a river <laughs> of flowing of fluids from your food where the toxins can get in easily but the cells are so stressed they're active ability to select the nutrients the body really wants is reduced. So when you have inflammatory gut problems, you're, you're absorbing less nutrients and more toxins, which is why these things are hard to recover from because there's this progressive process of you becoming more and more malnourished. It was probably some degree of toxicity and malnourishment that got you there in the first place where you now you have permeable gut. And it turns out oxalate is a great critter to help promote permeable gut. And what we know from there's another form of uh, this problem of overloading your body with too much oxalate can come from internal production in a disease called primary hyperoxaluria, which means high oxalate in the urine coming from an internal source. And this is a genetic mistake where the liver is overproducing oxalate. Actually, your liver makes oxalate. People think of the liver as the detoxing organ and they think, oh, well, if your liver works, you're fine, right? And all toxins are handled. Except oxalate doesn't work that way. The kidneys are a major detox organ, as is your skin and even your lungs. They're all releasing things your body doesn't need or needs to have less of. You know, your lungs are, are helping you control your pH, for example, and your kidneys are doing amazing things. The liver and the kidneys are fascinating 
organs that we don't even fully understand yet. Um, and mm-hmm. I love the kidneys because they're <laughs> like an underdog team. They're like the Red Sox. Like you want to love them because nobody understands how great they are. <laughs> yeah, so I know. Fabulous. They do a lot. They're pretty amazing. They do a lot of things that, you know, when I started studying kidneys, I didn't realize how much actually do. You know, they they do a lot more than people give them credit for, for sure. Well, we're taught in school simplistic ideas. Even those of us who are really interested in biology and health, you know, the kidneys make urine and clean out, you know, excess nitrogen. And that, that's all it does. And that's all they you, do. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Are you kidding? They have all these sensing abilities. They turn on and off hormone processes and regulation, even growth and just so many things they do. We have undersold the body and its brilliance and every cell in the body has a certain amount of intelligence and even that poor permeable gut still has some ability to read its a chemical environment and try to communicate with the rest of the body about what's going on and oxalate is sending signals like so many molecules do when you get enough of them they become a communicator enough of the chemical in the soup tells those cells something that they interpret and understand and that's called signaling right Mm -hmm. it could be amino acids it can be an oxalate ions it can be lots of things but the cells are brilliant and they're receiving and reading their environment in order so that you can amazingly survive constantly changing scenarios of what you eat what you're doing what the weather is what your stage of life is whether you're pregnant or giving birth or need to give birth like there's so (laughs) much brilliance going on like get this kid out of my body right now the body decides that <laughs> and with, so with oxalate you know it, one of the things to remind i guess remind everybody is that this is a, a the kind of the end of metabolism for breaking down carbo- carbohydrates or fats like you kind of run out of carbon so carb you know we get all of our energy from the bonds in between carbon atoms and oxalate is out of energy basically there's no way for the body to kind of use that carbon source anymore because once it's got to the point where it's all oxygens with no hydrogens on them and double bonds it's it's pulled all the energy it can from from the carbons in between and now you're left with this terminal product oxalate and so we have to get rid of it because it kind of doesn't have any other function for what we would use it for we can't you know we have to put energy into it if we wanted to use it for building something up and we can't get any more energy out of it, so we got to usually just get rid of it somehow. And we either have to pee it out or poop it out or sweat it out. One of those ways has to come out of it somehow. And in plants, plants are using it for storage purposes or defense. So they either you know, need to have a way to store onto their potassium and sodium or calcium stores. You know, they don't need bones, so they got to have a way to hold on to these different minerals. And then if they are developing it for defense, they can load up on it so that animals don't eat them and deter them from eating them because it's so dangerous to consume large amounts of oxalate at once. So it's kind of, you know, just so everybody kind of gets the picture about what oxalate it really is, it's it's normal. It's just it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous because just life uses energy and life produces oxalate in, in the process. And so it's something that's been around for a very long, long, long time. You know, it's <laughs> as long as there's been metabolism, oxalate has been around. And so we've had to figure out ways to cope with oxalate in the environment. And so the kidneys have, have developed a very sophisticated way to deal with it. And you know, too much of it is a problem, and it's there's all, but there's always going to be some around. You can't escape oxalate because it's just it is part of life, and it's you know it's part of what we evolved to deal with. And so I know that you know there's now we're you know we're kind of talking about now the you know what oxalate is, but you know what is it that's what is it that is the the real problem now? So people are are eating a lot more oxalate. You know what are the some of the the manifestations of of what this actually looks like when people are consuming too much oxalate. Yeah, so um, just to recap on oxalate in the plant foods we eat, oxalate is in plant foods and really not in animal foods. And there are some plants that make more and that includes in the greens department, there's three or four greens to be concerned about. The spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens. Swiss chard is basically beet greens. It's the same plant essentially. So that's almost the same thing. And then sorrel, which in the U.S., very few people use sorrel, only like fancy chefs, and they only give you a little swirl on your plate anyway. So 
It's all 17. <laughs> but if you get really exotic and you're growing your own things or doing wild harvesting, you could get into varieties of foods that are some high oxalate foods. But basically, it's not the greens that are high oxalate foods. Almost everything else that's leafy and green is pretty low in oxalate. But unfortunately, kidney doctors aren't taught the, that, so they'll tell you to quit eating greens. But that's not what we're talking about. Mm-hmm. We're talking about specifically scalpel surgical awareness of where oxalate really is and where it really isn't and that takes some sophistication for lots of reasons we might get into that one but mm-hmm. nuts all the popular nuts in in the keto eating is right now the three big things that people tend to do when they go on the low carb diet is to eat more almonds and other kinds of nuts to use them to make a, a almond meal which we call flour and turn it into muffins and and carb substitutes and dessert substitutes to use that as well as an almond butter to replace whatever and also put it in the blender along with some spinach and make these spinach almond milk almond paste smoothies and then to use plenty of dark cacao and super fancy dark chocolates because therefore then you still have your dessert but it's not too sweet but those are all really high oxalate foods that are high bioavailability, meaning they ionize easily and they float in between the cells easily and get into your blood. So those are some of the foods we'd be concerned about nowadays. Soluble or insoluble, right? Is that what you're referring those to? Those are they're the, the ions are the insoluble kind. And then the insoluble oxalate in the plants are those defense crystals. You were mentioning how mm. plants make them yeah. for storage of calcium and other minerals, and they also use them for defense. And we see this in lots of ways, like the the uh, the outer layers of the raspberry seed has a little tiny ring of oxalate crystals around that seed, which does a lot of things for that seed. It protects it from invaders. It, it protects it from weather and so on. It also stores that calcium that it's going to need later when it germinates. So later it'll it'll break down the calcium oxalate crystals to germinate so it can use the calcium as a enzyme initiator to get the enzymes going again. So trees do the same thing. They put these square bricks of oxalate in their bark, and that helps to prevent the beetles from drilling holes through their bark. And trees produce mm. a lot of oxalate every year, shedding it off as bark. Um, and we even get oxalate in the in the pollution, by the way. I mean, you did a great job of talking about how oxalate is part of life itself and part of the metabolism of breaking bonds with carbons. But even in the clouds, the combination of water, light and pollution creates oxalate. It's such a small chemical. It's just a set set of chemicals that get together and form oxalate easily. And so vitamin C, for example, just naturally degrades into oxalate, which is one reason why plants make vitamin C in order to make oxalate, because it's so Mm -hmm. easy to turn vitamin C just by degradation. So it doesn't have to be even metabolic processes, you can put vitamin C in a capsule and let it sit around for a while and some of that will degrade into oxalate. So yeah, oxalate is everywhere, but certain foods are high and others are not. So when you eat a lot of high oxalate foods, you begin to eat crystals and the soluble ions. Both the ions and the crystals are kind of hard on the digestive tract. So we see that in the genetic form of the disease too, that even the people who aren't in, aren't necessarily getting their disease strictly from diet, but have too much oxalate in their body overall, their main, their main symptom is uh, gut problems. Hmm. So that's fascinating because the gut is also trying to help excrete oxalate somewhat. Whenever the kidneys are overloaded, stressed, and there's acidity in the bottom, body, that seems to be turning on these molecules that can move oxalate out of the blood back into the colon these excretors and they when turn on when, are, it. when people are consuming large amounts of oxalate does that mostly is the interference that you're referring to is that because crystallization is occurring in the gut or because transport like it's getting you know kind of filtered through the body and then cu- coming back on the so there's the apical side which would be in the inside the colon and then there's the basal lateral side is it the oxalate that's on the apical in the inside the colon or is it on the basal lateral where it's actually the blood supply of oxalate that's affecting these cells? Do you have any clue? Um, I, I have to imagine that it's both. And the sad thing is that we have to imagine it because okay. all the research dollars have gone into the kidney part. Mm-hmm. That's what we're, I'm trying to say is like, boy, there's so much going on before we get to the kidney stone 
that we haven't devoted resources and we haven't put some genius minds towards and we haven't mm-hmm. raised the genius mind to get there. And these days in research, um, you really need to use your best minds on your most important stuff. Because a, a lot of us can now struggle through our PhD and carry on a research career. And it doesn't mean that we're Einstein, you know, and in some of these trickier problems really require high level thinking leadership, especially when the predominant thinking is, has decided that all that matters is if you get kidney stones, the rest of it is not there. So, Mm -hmm. all right. So we're eating it. So that's the, the luminal side of, you know, inside the gut that's obviously already there's room for problems occurring. And then if you're also asking your colon to keep excreting it from that basal lateral side, you've got more oxalate traffic and the more exposure to something that's so reactive is an issue because what happens to these cells is their membranes get scrambled. So whether it's the electromagnetic field from the crystals or the ions, now research is saying both or one or the other, and there's like there's still an argument about which is worse. And the mm-hmm. nanocrystals are definitely a problem. Nanocrystals <laughs> definitely have some electromagnetic power to scramble the molecules in a membrane. So a mm-hmm. lot of the molecules that are supposed to be on the inside only get flipped, and they are out on the outside when there's a crystal nearby. The crystal doesn't even need to touch a membrane. So there's there's electromagnetic interference with the structure of membranes of cells and all the organelles in the cell that does the cell's work and thinking and production are also membranes. So you get that leakiness in mitochondria. So oxalate is a big mitochondrial stressor. You start messing with the membrane structure of a mitochondria and its role to move ions of, of, well, move protons, they call it a proton pump, that hydrogen molecule gets segregated on one side of a membrane versus the other. That's how we produce cellular energy. If your membrane is damaged, the ability of the barrier function of the membrane to carry on breaks, and then you lose your ability to segregate the proton. So the whole proton pump process of a mitochondria gets decimated. Then you have lower production of ATP And the immune system doesn't like that. When the cells are lower in ATP, the immune system detects the cell damage, the leaking of the protons, the leaking of the potassium, the lower ATP. Now, when a cell has low levels of ATP, it has trouble controlling the ionic balance in a cell. Now, ionic balance sounds fancy, but it's basically little (laughs) molecules of calcium is the main one in cells. It's called the calcium sparks. And the cell puts out these tiny, tiny little amounts of calcium ions in different parts of the cell, depending on different what, where the different proteins are in the membranes. But in little segments of the cell, you'll see the one of the organelles like the endoplasmic reticulum will put out a couple of calcium ions and that tells the membrane stuff has to happen. This is how the cell communicates what the cell's priorities should be metabolically, whether we should be generating new things for the membranes or whatever we need to do. But the the way this works is you have to be able to generate and disappear and generate and disappear ions of calcium sub-instantaneously, so quick you can't even think about it. It's very surprising how fast it needs to be. (laughs) It's amazing. So what does that? These proton pumps on the cell membranes, they are ATP pumps that move calcium in and out or out of the cell primarily, right? Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough ATP, you can't remove your calcium fast enough from your cell. And your cell's ability to know what's going on and what it's doing starts collapsing. Mm -hmm. And this can affect genetic expression and can literally turn cells that are muscle cells or vascular cells into bone cells. And so this is why some researchers say oxalate causes atherosclerosis and hardening of the arteries because it literally turns the smooth muscle cells in the vascular system into bone cells and creates vascular calcification. That's interesting. Go ahead. The whole whole, uh, process, you know, I'm thinking about this because it's, it's really fascinating that you know this these crystals you know we, you know and I'm there's a, you know I've read a lot of papers and we've ta- they've talked a lot about how oxalate crystals can kind of activate this you know in, inflammasome so the the NLRP3 inflammasome is a known downstream effector of the of the oxalate crystals there's not really discussion about how that occurs there's no like arrow in between 
<laughs> inflammasome activation and crystal, you know, we, we don't really know, like, you know, they don't talk about at least, you know, its interaction with the membrane, its interaction with organelles. And that electrostatic interaction is very important. I think that's a, a really interesting piece that you bring up because if these are intracellular, which they certainly can be because they have the ability to, you know, punch through membranes if they're, you know, they're, they've got a lot, they're sharp, you know, you know, so they can get through membranes or they might just get through by getting engulfed by phagocytosis. Um, but yeah, there's, that's a really interesting aspect of them. They're, they're electrostatic, uh, interactions. I hadn't fully considered that. And that, you know, it makes a lot of sense though, like that, that would disrupt a, a cell quite dramatically, you know, that would cause a lot of damage very easily. So I think that was a really interesting thought, you know, just, just envisioning that whole process, especially with, when it comes to, you know, mitochondrial damage, anytime you damage the mitochondria, you your your cells done like you don't have a cell any longer you basically have to just abandon ship and call in the immune cells to come deal with everything and that's a whole whole problem right it's, you have you have that on mass scale right so and you have it going on after every meal with oxalate it's just your body's so good at it you're not going to notice a few hundred cells you killed from that spinach smoothie because you got a few trillion more <laughs> and the body is real good about not alerting you to stuff it's handling for you. You know, it really mm. waits until things are in crisis to let you know. And we know this because a lot of these people who have the genetic form of oxalate overload disease don't get diagnosed until within four years of their death. Mm. Like they they could take decades of being overloaded and they find, oh my gosh, this guy, we knew he had this disease and we didn't give him a new liver because that's how they help these people they require a new liver. Now they're working on something a little more sophisticated in the future where we might be able to do like stem cell liver stuff and not necessarily have them on anti-rejection drugs forever. But the, um, the thing is, by the time they realize they really need the new liver is after the bone marrow is completely filled up with oxalate crystals. And now you can't produce enough healthy blood cells when you don't have working bone marrow. Mm. And this can happen sub clinically, like you don't have many symptoms, you don't have the bone pain, you might have funky blood counts. And I myself had low white blood counts for most of my last 15 years or so before I got on this diet. And now my blood counts are fine. Um, and I have evidence that I have bone accumulation of oxalate. And I'm working that out now seven years, it's going to take more years for my body to clean it out. But as you said, there's always oxalate in the body. Like the body mm -hmm. knows about oxalate because it's part of reality. The thing is the body knows about a reasonable amount and has a capacity. The way we're eating now, not only choosing these particularly outrageously high foods as important daily foods, but we never ever stop eating them. We don't get seasonal breaks from them. I think in the past, if we did ever need to rely on almonds or raspberries or even spinach, it was for a month or two. It wasn't for 12 or 20 or 40 years with no break. But now you grow up on peanut butter and potatoes. Those are very high oxalate foods. Is French fries and chips terribly high oxalate foods? When you deep fry a soluble compound, you take the water out, but you seal in Seal in the soluble oxalate. So it's like 80% soluble oxalate in a potato <laughs> chip, you know? So you don't have to be like me, a health geek who's willing to grow and eat something gross like Swiss chard. You could just be a secret potato chip pig and love your peanuts <laughs> and get yourself in big trouble. And that's particularly damaging because those foods are so deficient. I mean, potato chips have no nutrients in them and they're not fortified. Unlike white bread and these other sort of staple foods where we've forced fake nutrition by putting in fortification, we don't do that with things like French fries and potato chips or even peanuts. So since they're not sprayed with B vitamins, they're especially damaging in the long run. I have worked with a few people who are in their 30s who've broken their health completely with deep fibromyalgia and so on. Men who chose in high school to live on Pringles and things like that as a sort of rebellion or, you know, I'll live my life how I want to kind of mm -hmm. approach. And they're paying a big price for it. And none of their doctors are aware of what their illness really is because we have yeah, only right. think of this as a kidney stone problem. I'd say it's interesting with potatoes, you know, most of the minerals and stuff are in the skin, 
like the, you know, the potassium and sodium, all the things that, you know, you kind of get or, you know, peel it off and then you're stuck with the, the part that has just the calories and, <laughs> and the oxalate. <laughs> well, and kind of actually funny. the skin has the most anti-nutrient things, including the oxalate. I mean, the skin is, oh, 20 times more concentrated in oxalate than the flesh. It, it does but, have the, the minerals though. Yeah. You know, well, <laughs> maybe because they're oxalate and potassium together they're oxalating like yeah (laughs) that's the thing about the way we measure compounds in foods though we have to dissolve them down into their essential components and we don't necessarily always distinguish calcium oxalate from available calcium and so there hasn't been good nutrition science on true bioavailability of nutrients versus a laboratory's ability to extract a mineral and claim that it's there that's not Mm. the same thing as it being appropriate Nutritionally, the sad thing is, Jacob, we knew this in 1930. Mm -hmm. Like we've known it for 90 years that even though you can measure a lot of calcium in spinach, if you give spinach to the rats, they die. Mm. Do you know about those old studies? No, but that's, I mean, I believe it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, if you've, they don't reproduce well, they don't grow to full size, they don't get strong bones, and they're unable to get pregnant or carry to full term. This one set of studies done in the mid 30s, um, where they just gave the the spinach as the form of calcium in addition to a canned food diet plus spinach. Um, The one female rat in that study that was able to reproduce gave birth to stillbirth babies that she ate immediately. She's so desperate for nutrition. She ate her dead. I mean, this is what oxalate does to you. You're so deficient in minerals (laughs) and nutrients. (laughs) You can't grow full bones, a full body, or reproduce appropriately if you're a Mm. lab rat eating spinach. So we've known, I mean, the point of those studies, I mean, what we should have learned from those studies and should still be known today is that just because there is calcium in spinach, if it's calcium oxalate or there's so much oxalate there that you can't use it, it's basically devoid of calcium, even though mm-hmm. you claim it's high calcium based on chemical analyses. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with a lot of foods, right? That's the same thing with soy is another a really common one, right? Soy has very high protein, but by available protein is quite low. I mean, this is just the, the world we live in right now is not very quantitative in terms of bioavailability, unfortunately. But it's it a is something huge to problem. consider. It's yeah. sort of embarrassing to be from the field of nutrition and be this age and see us make so little progress on this bioavailability thing that should matter a lot in nutrition. And mm-hmm. sadly, a lot of what's blocking our ability to get those proteins out of beans and foods like that is the polyphenols. Mm. They are enzyme inhibitors. And so they inhibit your enzymes, and that's why you can't necessarily get all the protein that's supposedly in the beans. Uh, and the sad thing is we're promoting polyphenols because they, they might have, in lab tests, they seem to have all these great effects. But in real life, they have enough bad effects that whatever possible great effects they have, it may not be worth the price you pay. Mm-hmm. It's true. It's, very, it's just a blanket statement. Polyphenols are... Are somehow good and it's un- we don't know what they even do for the most part a lot of them or you know if the body, uh, bodies are willing to have them play in their field because the body's real clever like it's got it covered it's brought us from swinging in the trees to building rome and beyond and <laughs> it's done a lot for us without having to push the polyphenol idea and this, chances are the body's trying to not absorb polyphenols and then trying to get rid of them really fast because they're really just kind of getting in the way of business, not necessarily what the body's asking for. Yeah, I think that some of them are providing, you know, potentially uh, hermetic stress, though. I think that's maybe the more of their function rather than their their role. You know, antioxidant right. role, I don't buy. I don't believe that that's probably their function. It's more likely that they are injurious in some way and so they cause a stress response and then exactly we kind of re- are more resilient because of the injury and at low quantities and a variety of them then that's a good thing because you're getting small do- doses of po- poison around and then at high doses and consistency that's where we run into problems and that's that seems to be the issue like that we're really describing is yeah you can eat spinach when it's in season and then that's it. You're not going to don't eat it anymore. Or you may eat it as a, a few leaves in the, you know, in, in wild, you might find a patch of spinach somewhere. And 
that's going to be all you're going to get. You're not going to eat it with giant bags and blend it up and <laughs> day, out, day in and day out. So I think that's, you know, I think this is, there's a lot of context here for people. You know, the big one is being that seasonality, right? Like getting foods in season probably is, you know, that's what we evolved to do. We evolved to have things that regional, you know, our evolution, depending on where we, we evolved as a, you know, our ethnicity is going to have a big a factor in like what foods we can process. And I think that if we kind of pay attention to seasonality and eat things as they show up, rather than just going to the grocery store and getting whatever you want, whenever you want it at the same, you know, I eat, I eat spinach because that's what I like. And that's what I'm going to eat every day. That's, that's where we run into problems. And that's with every food, right? I don't think that there's any any food that doesn't work that way. I think we have to kind of work with the seasons a little more. Well, the interesting thing about a the idea of hermetics that you need a little bit of stress to turn on your defense strategies and make you powerful, you know, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. <laughs> the thing is, we used to have that just from cold weather. Right. You know, running around, having to chase down your dinner. That's enough hermetic stress to keep you strong and vibrant. You didn't need to artificially implant hermetic stress with polyphenol pills. It, it just wasn't needed. And, and you can still have hermetic stress with, you know, take a cold shower, go out and walk, do an exercise, try to walk barefoot on the grass, you know, like stress yourself a little bit. Uh, do hot sauna. That's a really great anti-inflammatory. It, it mm -hmm. increases nitric oxide in the vascular system. There's so many ways to get hermetic stresses. There's no rule that it has to be from toxins from plants that yeah. will tear up your gut and interfere with your digestion of proteins. The other thing is about, you know, the wild spinach, so to speak. Almost everything in the produce department never existed till humans invented yeah. them. <laughs> Exactly. There is no wild produce. If you go out in the wild, you get pine cones and dandelions, <laughs> which you can eat. But, yeah. you know, pine needles will only take you so far. And if you try to eat the bushes in your front yard, you're probably going to not have a good night or a good week. <laughs> and you're not going to let your three-year-old run out and eat the berries off your yew bush. You know inherently that plants aren't good for your kids to just randomly eat whatever is growing in the yard. So to think of... Uh, plants in the produce department is a wild food is a fantasy because they've yeah, all been true. through human ingenuity. We've developed the produce aisle and mm -hmm. we're developing the nuts and so on. So there's that. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, and it's, I do it think that humans ate assume. a lot of the same foods over and over again. I think, you know, at certain times of year you were fishing whale up in Alaska, they're eating seal and caribou and seal and fish and seal and walrus and seal and <laughs> caribou. And like, it was kind of monotonous and it was, they were eating it a lot. And, and meats like that were just designed to eat. They're easily broken down. They don't have a lot of anti-nutrients because they're built to the same material we are. I mean, muscles and mm -hmm. organs and animals are so similar to us. We use animals to study our own health. And, and yes, we can eat what we're made of because it isn't inherently non-toxic. So I'd say that would be the exception to the rule. It's probably okay to eat meat routinely. The weird part is that nutrition science has been telling us that eating meat isn't good for 40 years. And so we feel like that's off the table, like actually eating protein from real protein with has got complete amino acid content that's easy to digest that doesn't have crystals in it and doesn't have toxins and electromagnetic stress is somehow bad for us and you know that's where things have really gotten off the rails and people are completely flummoxed about what to eat mm -hmm. and they hear about yeah, and they're like oh well now there's nothing i can eat i'll just throw myself <laughs> over a cliff and eat pringles <laughs> So one of the things, you know, we've talked about, too, is that you say don't just take all the oxalate out of the diet, right? Like, because that causes a whole bunch of other problems. So how do people actually go from consuming, if they are consuming a high oxalate diet, you know, they hear this and they're like, I'm, I eat Pringles and I eat spinach together <laughs> at the same time. How do they, how do they uh, go from that to maybe lowering or should they remove it or how, what's the process there? 
Yeah. So there's a number of ways to do this. And eventually it would help for you to have actual specific numbers about how much oxalates are in foods. And I'm, I'm working on making that more available to people so that it becomes easier. But I can tell you the most natural way to do this is kind of a joke, but it also teaches you a lot. People like my husband and some of my followers' husbands, their wives went out once they learn that they want to be off oxalate because of their arthritis and their irritable bladder and they're getting up all night and whatever it is bothering them, they decided, uh oh, we're going to change the diet. So without asking permission, they went ahead and changed what they bought and what they prepared. And the guys are like, well, going along with it because, hey, it's dinner. And <laughs> then on their own, the guys are buying, still buying their little treat, whatever that is, like the chocolate bar or getting their French fries when they go out for lunch or getting their black bean burrito. Those are all great ways to keep some oxalate around. Just keep a little black beans on your burrito. Eat some of those fries at Five Guys. You know, keep your little secret oxalate habits spared from your wife. And what you're doing there is a kind of a clever thing because you're bringing your overall intake down from what could could have easily been well over a thousand milligrams of oxalate or a whole gram of oxalate a day. Some people are in almost to 3000, which is dangerously what, high. What's, a, what's a, a normal daily amount, safe amount? Um, yeah. So uh, we don't actually know because we have such oh, okay. bad research on this, but the, all the researchers tell themselves that we're eating 150 milligrams a day of oxalate. So okay. that would be in terms of uh, spinach or chocolate, let me think if I can remember my numbers right. So if we're getting 150 a day, we're probably eating a third of a cup of raw spinach leaves or, well, with spinach, it's kind of That's like, nothing. yeah, you get, yeah, no, uh, raw spinach leaves, a third of a cup. I mean, most salads are at That's least a nothing. cup and a half. Right. Yeah. So that's what we're getting. That's our normal intake is, let's see if it's 150, that's, um, I think of it in leaves. It's like 10 leaves is 50. So that's 30, 30 leaves of spinach a day is normal. And then mm. everything else is just animal products because you're eating only 150 a day. That's what science tells us. Maybe a window between 100 and 250. I would say if you're under 250, you're probably not creating a huge oxalate problem if you've been that way for a long time. But most of us are probably eating... I, you know, if I if I had to really guess on people who were trying to eat well or else who were just eating too much potatoes and, and peanuts, I would guess that most people are closer to 900 milligrams a day. Okay. That would be common. Um, but unfortunately, anyone who's doing keto diet is probably closer to 2,500, something outrageously oh, wow. high. If you're using almonds and nuts almonds. and the spinach. Okay. Yeah. And once you've added spinach seriously to your daily diet, you're definitely in the over a thousand kind of thing. So okay. if you cut it all the way down to 250 a day or a hundred a day, somewhere in that narrow range, that is taking a lot of stress down. That really high excess amount is lowering the stress and giving your body a chance to adjust. There's lots of things that your body adjusts to when you change your diet in any way. And one of them is microbiome switching over because you're every time you switch your diet, you're providing a different set of foods. So you don't want a really quick microbiome die off in any diet change. It doesn't matter whether you're going low oxalate or not. You, you don't want to do dramatic shifts because you will, I think, create a little bit of a die off toxicity that's not going to be pleasant. Um, mm -hmm. So it's always good to kind of taper down. And with the oxalates, we taper down because of that signaling. Remember I was saying when you have a certain amount of compounds, the body's reading it. The gut is reading how much is there. The vascular system is reading how much is there. The kidneys are reading how much is there and telling itself a lot of things. So when it stays down low for like five days, that seems to be a signal really low, like well under 100 milligrams a day. That tells the body, winter's here, coast is clear, we're finally going to get a chance to get rid of the oxalate that's been backing up in the system. Because what's been happening, which we haven't emphasized very much, is that when we're eating as much as we are with modern, eat the same thing, eat peanuts every day or whatever it is, we are exceeding kidney capacity. 
And the body does not like that and is really protective of the kidneys because the kidneys are kind of the gateway to a healthy life. If you can't get rid of your garbage, you're going to end up being a garbage pile. (laughs) So the body makes some sacrifices, right? And it doesn't like it in the blood plasma either because the blood is delivering calcium and these ions that help keep your pacemaker going and your heart going. So if you don't have enough of the right ions in your blood, the heart starts getting a little nervous and the pacemaker gets a little weird and you get into arrhythmias so the body didn't do that either so we're going to keep the kidneys protected if the kidneys are saying hey guys we're stressed here um, the body is doing lots of different things in the background including trying to allow oxalate to release in waves so it gets Mm -hmm. a load of oxalate then it gets a rest load and rest road and rest so we're, we're designed to sleep every single day we must sleep every single day because we always need the downtime in order to manage our biology and and to keep going. So um, the body's automatically doing this even during the day and it has its own, we don't know anything about this. We really haven't studied how it's doing all this background regulation. But what um, Susan Marengo's work showed us with many pumps and rats is that there's, in the standard kind of diet, there's probably a 4% retention rate. So of what gets absorbed from your diet, about 4% is getting blocked, backed up in your tissues, in your bones, bone marrows, your glands. Like so many of us have crystals in our thyroid gland. It's, it's normal. Uh, if you've lived on the planet long enough and you've been eating, you've been collecting oxalate. So when you lower it, the body's like, hey, we've been waiting for this winter for decades and we are so ready for this. And it, some people's systems will very aggressively start trying to go after oxalate back up in the body. Now, this is mostly in crystals, right? Some of those crystals have been carefully wrapped by the immune system in something called nets or granulomas. So these crystals end up looking kind of benign in pathology studies because you won't necessarily at that moment that you've taken the sample see the giant cells and so on. But what you might notice is some dead DNA, which is what's called a net that is insulating that crystal, protecting the the surrounding cells and keeping it from interacting with the cells. So you break down that electromagnetic potential by wrapping it in either dead white blood cells, old granuloma materials, or these DNA nets that the immune system makes in order to segregate these crystals and keep them quiescent so there's no symptoms with them. But to get them out of there, you need to bring back the immune system and turn on basically a gout attack All right, so the immune system comes back online. It has to spew acids and and collagenase and so on to break up these crystals, and and that causes local tissue damage. And that can also bring on a lot of mast cell activation, and you'll see things like bladder irritability. People get like this bladder stuff. It's almost like having a rash inside your bladder. That's quite unpleasant. That's a very specific group that get that reaction. Other people... Literally, I have people who get rashes that pop out on their skin. Sometimes they're little blister corpuscles. And in each little blister, there's a little bit of white grit coming out. And I've had people mail me the white grit, and some of it is quite big. <laughs> quite big. What so luckily, the skin from, from can just push the whole crystal out without the immune system having to bombard the tissues with collagenase and acid. It can just create some kind of bubble blister and push crystals out. We get them in the eyes. I actually have one going on right now that's just finishing up. I've had an attack recently that's this big red spot uh, on the top of my eye with a, uh, just big inflammation. This is part of the body clearing oxalate out. So it requires inflammation to remove the oxalate. But if it's got to break it up into ions and nanocrystals, it's going to go back into the bloodstream and back into the kidneys. And you can Mm. raise the oxalate levels in the bloodstream after you lower it in the diet because you're now releasing it internally. And we see this in little case examples over and over and over again in the literature There's a great case from a woman in London from 25 years ago who, you know, they waited too late to really recognize what was going on with her. She was a hyper absorber. She had lymph problems in her gut. And when they put her on the low oxalate diet, her very high oxalate levels in her blood plasma, which is rare to have that, tripled after she went on the low oxalate diet. Wow. And that surprised them. And 25, we still haven't learned that when you lower oxalate, you release it 
if it's been building up in the body because we mm-hmm. haven't recognized this extra renal accumulation problem. And we, we just haven't been studying it. We haven't been looking at it because we made some great pro- proclamations 50 years ago that we keep repeating without ever questioning that assumption. Even though Susan Marengo's work clearly, and she hi- was highly respected. And the reason this got dropped is because she retired to have children. She she quit this line of research because she wanted to have children. And, you know, Lab researchers don't get weekends and evenings. How do you raise a two-year-old when you're never home? So simple human things like that sometimes get in the way of our advancement of science. You know, like, okay, no one else cares. The one who did or noticed it, this was breakthrough research, and there hasn't been a lot of follow-up on it yet. But Mm. I'm thinking now that so many of us are discovering oxalate poisoning in our own lives. It's going to come back around, and somebody's going to pick up on this. When when was that observation made? The um the Marengo studies? Yeah. Or the one from 25 years ago with the high The one that you were Oh, the high oxalate you said 25 years ago? Yeah, the was... the the case, well there's several examples of this in um in the literature. Although, you know, they're they're like little tiny diamonds hidden in thousands and millions and millions of research articles. <laughs> you have to be able to dig and dig and dig. And that's why I found this stuff, because I've spent six years reading the literature. But that one case, I can send you the the uh, citation of it. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it's, yeah. It's, it's just an established fact. It's just, it's clearly been observed. It just hasn't, its importance hasn't been recognized. And no one's written a grant to say, we got to study why this goes up and where it's coming from and how the body is clearing oxalate. Like they know this happened. We know it's well established that the body does collect oxalate and there is a release process because Mm -hmm. of primary hyperoxaluria. But the focus has always been on how to create a new drug, which surgery to do, when to do the surgery. We need to know clinically how to recognize these folks and how to help them. That's important focus. But mm-hmm. the, the bigger understanding about the fact that it's hard to diagnose them, that they all have this confusing multitude of symptoms that involves room, rheumatological problems, lots of pain and so on. And they're all very different. Every single case of the genetic form of this disease is very unique. And so that means all the other forms coming from dietary and, and precursor over ingestion or overexposure. Um, is also highly variable and unique, which makes it hard to study. Yeah, variability is hard to study. <laughs> That's I'll tell you that. We like reproducibility. That's our favorite. We like reproducibility. So you can see how this wouldn't be a great career move. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of funding, not a lot of interest. That's exactly where I want to be. <laughs> High but impact, I tell you, the more it's kind of like any other like AIDS or whatever, you get enough people whose loved ones are in agony over oxalate poisoning and you will get some determined people. Mm-hmm. You know, I decided to not go back to academia after the low oxalate diet restored me to someone who could actually do something because um, I was completely disabled by oxalates. I was on the couch, unable to exercise, unable to read the mail unable to do anything except figure out why is my life ended here? What's happened to me? Um, there'll be enough of this where at some point we'll get back to studying this. But in the mm-hmm. meantime, it should be simple. Something that could kill somebody shouldn't be eaten in abundance and shouldn't be promoted <laughs> as a health food. <laughs> right. I know. It's it's kind of crazy the world we live in. <laughs> the sim- you know, it's a simple, simple thing. You know, we know it's there. But it's kind of a, yeah, neither here nor there. Cultural. Always- we're, we're so cultural in nature and we're so social in nature. We'd rather stay in alignment with our culture than notice a fact. Mm-hmm. True. We've just went through a number of years with that, I think, as a country. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're all pretty much, we're accustomed to it now. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I love simplicity. I have been in the field of research and understand the timeline and all of that. And I don't think we need to wait for more information to know that 
overdosing people with oxalate, especially anyone with obesity, anyone with inflammation, anyone with gut problems, anyone with kidney problems should be spared from high oxalate foods and be warned of them. Places like nursing homes and hospitals and daycare centers and places where there are vulnerable people should be mm -hmm. automatically protected from toxins, especially oxalate. Oxalate is so especially important because of this bioaccumulation, because of its crystallization, because of its fundamental get you in the mitochondrial throat mm -hmm. kind of effects, we ought to be swinging broad and wide around oxalate rather than embracing it as nothing to worry about. Yeah. Well, so just, you know, we're getting long here, but I wanted to just kind of wrap it up. I wanted to say what if people wanted to act on this now, what are the big takeaways just so that they can, you know, you want to start right now. What, what should I do if I want to, you know, kind of get on the low oxalate train? Yeah. So you got to learn a little bit about which foods are high in oxalate. And you can do that easily. You can go to my website. There's some stuff there you can get. And I'm on Instagram, there's some real simple stuff there at SK Norton on Instagram. And fundamentally, you want to pick what your which ones are those really bad ones that you've been into a bit much and start cutting them out one at a time. And it's okay to have little bits of some of them um, for a while and get your body adjusting. So give yourself time to learn about it and to make adjustments. But if you're really into dark chocolate, you know, cut your portion down and then learn to live without it. Find something else you can eat. If you're really into peanut butter, find something else, maybe cheese. If you do peanut butter bedtime with your celery, try cheese and apple instead. If you're really into almonds and almond milk, try coconut milk instead and then heal your body enough and get good quality milk where you can actually digest it and tolerate it. Mm. Uh, the commercial milk is definitely causing some problems in a world of gut leakiness, but just start learning and don't give up on learning. And uh, there's there's it's exciting a process to do it's not as scary as it seems and i guess the other part is you know take some time to meditate on if you're like stuck on the idea that you have to have spinach like what is that attachment really about mm -hmm. yeah i know i i love dark chocolate and i love peanut butter and i i think about you all the time when i eat them <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> the devil of guilt over here. I'm the person with the little red horns. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I do cut back significantly. Since we've, since we've met, I've had a, a big cut back in both. So it's, it's made a difference. I don't, I, you know, I don't know. I don't always feel these things, but I've, you know, I do eat pretty well for the most part. And I don't have gut issues. I, I used to, and I don't anymore. So I think hmm. maybe that might be a big part of it. You know, yeah. I'm just, maybe I'm just pooping this stuff out. I don't have to, <laughs> to deal with it. Well, anymore. you have to keep in mind that the damage is silent until it's not. Until it's not, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And when it's not, it's usually too late. You know, like you're going to be like me and have 10 years of post low oxalate diet recovery, which is really unpleasant. And I'm so glad when younger people pick this up and preserve their career and preserve their, their life and their ambitions by avoiding this. I mean, there's so little benefit to any of these high oxalate foods. They really can't be justified other than some kind of self-pleasuring thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. I mean, that people are, are pretty into that. I mean, I can attest dark chocolate is delicious. <laughs> you know, it's hard to get away from. <laughs> Really yeah, good. and you're lucky enough to not be as motivated as those of us who've been so broken by it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've had my own, you know, health struggles. And I think that was, you know, that's what got me into the, the paleo diet and on this track of all this nutrition science in the first place was I, I had arthritis going into grad school. Like, I st you know, they were saying, oh, you just have arthritis. There's nothing you can do about it. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that was I was like, I couldn't hold a pipette anymore. Oh, so no, that where, that's where I was taping my fingers together so I could, you know, deal with it. You know, you get my glove and then tape my hands so I could hold the pipette and still work without having, you know, severe pain. But it was getting bad. So, I, you know, I said, there's got to be something. I got to be able to do something about it. And, you know, then I did switch to paleo and then I, a wheat. I found wheat was the big one. That was the one that really I for me, that's made the biggest change in my life is cutting out wheat. So a lot of the things you describe, that's wheat for me. Like it's well, it's and and that's vain. a really good point you make too. Just as an as back to that thing about what people should do. A lot of us who are damaged with oxalate do have this arthritis, and 
going gluten free really helps with the oxalate thing because of the gut permeability. The gut, exactly. So yeah, the gut permeability issue is, is, is huge there. So I feel like that was a big part of it too, was just gut permeability. And then, you know, I had injured my hands over the years from playing sports. And so I think it was just gut permeability plus inflammation kind of really targeted the places that were already damaged. But it's, I, yeah, it's, I think that made a huge difference. And then I started doing paleo. Yeah. Then I ate more almond flour and I ate more, uh, <laughs> more spinach. <laughs> so then I just kind of really switched that around. I basically only eat arugula and lettuce now for the most part. See, that's excellent. And, and, you know, you don't need psychotherapy to get over the spinach. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> But it's really profound that we do overuse things like our hands and knuckles or feet or something, and that at night the body would normally repair those tissues and you'd be okay. But when you eat high oxalate all day long, your highest level of oxalate in your plasma is overnight because mm -hmm. it takes that lag time of absorption to build up in your plasma. So oxalate's interfering with the recovery problem. So it can lead to carpal tunnel and things we think of as re repetitive stress arthritis can very much just be because oxalate's interfering with that connective tissue repair overnight. So mm -hmm. you do yourself a huge favor by, you know, not only healing the gut, but not having so much oxalate every night when you're healing. And now your tissues can be healed and, and they recover. The body's always reaching for healing. You just have mm -hmm. to get out of its way. I know. It's fascinating. Just give it a chance. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good place to wrap it up. I, you know, thanks for spending the time with me. That was, it's really informative. And um, I'm thinking about things. I'm thinking about a lot of experiments, really. Oh, I can't I wait. I, we really got to do more experiments and, and start collecting <laughs> more of these um, more qualitative things on our, on our subjects. There are volunteers who are willing to participate. They have a lot to offer if we not just do more than just test their blood and urine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's good. Good advice. Well, uh, with that, thanks for joining me, and we hope to talk, talk to you soon. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. Bye.